Hey everyone, I think that I'm live now. Hey, this is Chris from Meeple Overboard. I'm sorry for the delay for anyone watching this live. Uh, camera issues, getting my camera to be recognized by the computer. Always, always one of the most fun things when you have to restart your computer right before live stream. But that's not why you're here. You're here to hear me talk about you are here to hear me. That's a weird sentence. You're here to listen to me talk about my top five games from Fantasy Flight Games. I mean, what can be said about Fantasy Flight? They're one of the biggest companies in the industry. Uh, they are part of Asmodee North America, so they have obviously the fantastic distribution and name recognition of, of all of that as well. But uh, they have also some of the licenses to fantastic properties, including a few properties that will not show up on this list, incidentally. But there are a lot of really good games in those systems and those genres and everything. So I'm here to talk about what my five favorite are. And it is tough to kind of narrow this down because some of my favorite games when I got into the gaming hobby were from Fantasy Flight. And uh, unfortunately now they aren't. And then some that I didn't get into until later when I was in the hobby have risen up. So you'll definitely see what I mean by that. So I'm going to go ahead and start with my number five. This is the newest game to peek onto my list. This is one that I've actually never played the physical version of, but I've played on Board Game Arena, and this is called Dragonheart. Uh, designed by Rudiger Dorn, actually, who is, in my estimation, just a fantastic, fantastic designer that doesn't have the same name recognition and, and punchiness when people say, this is a Rudiger Dorn game, the way that people like Uwe Rosenberg and Corey Kaniska have, because those are two absolute powerhouses <laughs> of the of the hobby. But uh, Rudiger Dorn is responsible for some of my favorite games, including Istanbul and and uh, Las Vegas, the dice game. And so Dragonheart is a small box little card game, and it's essentially super rock paper scissors which almost doesn't sound interesting right but you have a you have a, a deck of 50 cards your opponent has identical deck of 50 cards and you shuffle them up and then you have a shared board in the middle that has a bunch of different locations they all have cool little pieces of art on them like the dragon and archers and a sorceress and a rock and you play you take your turn and you play a card out onto one of those regions some regions need three or a set of four to fulfill and to fire off. If you play the third archer, it'll take down any dragons that have come out. But for every dragon that you play, you get to take out the rock, the treasure chest area. When you play treasure chests, they don't do anything, but the sorceress or the dragon can take out treasure chests. And when you take something out, you take it and put it into your scoring area, and it'll become points at the end of the game. So every card that you play out lets you draw another card. Or you can play two or three or four of the same kind of card and draw up that many. So on your turn, you have to play a card out. And it's only going to help either yourself or your one opponent. This is a head-to-head -head little card game. And it is uh, brilliant. Yes, Jordan uh, and I discovered this on our series of uh, our series called But We Don't Know the Rules. <laughs> we play games on Board Game Arena, but we don't know the rules. We just play it. We just click on things until one of us starts scoring and we say, ooh, let's do that, right? And we try and figure out what the rules are by the end of the game. And so we figured out that dragons blow up that craggy rock face thing. Uh, and it's like, yeah, so basically it's just this game of super rock, paper, scissors where every turn, unless you can complete something, you're hesitant to put a card out because maybe your opponent will will be able to benefit from that but you're hoping that they don't, and so when it comes back to you, maybe you've drawn the right card so you can complete a little rock, paper, scissory, rock, paper, scissor, lizard, wizard, Spock, dragon, uh, crag, is what I'm going to call this game. And it's it's really fun. I've played it quite a few times since playing it with Jordan on our Bo But We Don't Know the Rules stream, and uh, I'm going to continue to play this one for a long time. There is a reprint that just came out last year, but because of the pandemic, hasn't gotten U.S. distribution yet. And I think that it's going to be rethemed to Underwater Dragons. <laughs> it's going to be called Opal. Opal? Opal? So I'm genuinely going to be on the lookout for it because I think it's that fun. So my number four Fantasy Flight game is uh, a, a relatively new one. I think that this will be the newest game that they have produced 
on my list, and that's Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth. I really enjoy this system. It's the same system that they had from Mansions of Madness, where it's app-driven, and it tells you which tiles to pull out, and then you add them to the map and everything. And here's the thing, is I've come to discover that one of my least favorite mechanisms in games is, uh, you know, pull out tiles, A17I capital L lowercase l capital I 1 3 B. Okay, you know, you go through the stack, uh, you know, this is, no, this is capital L lowercase 2 B. Dang it, you know. I, I hate searching through stacks of tiles to add them to the map. I have come more and more to just really say, no, let's just have a map. You know, let's just have a fold-out map. And uh, I don't know. I want to reduce setup as much as possible. But for some reason, this one shines above the rest in this kind of series. We played the Imperial Assault game, uh, the cooperative mode with the same app type system. And it just didn't do it for me. I really liked it for a few scenarios, but it kind of dragged on. And the tiles are just worse in that. Mansions of Madness, the tiles are a little bit better, but I think I think that Lord of the Rings does it really well where the tiles are all different shapes and they have them like sequentially numbered in like 100s, 200s, 300s, and 400s so that just reduces the amount of stress and strain looking for a single tile. So it, it makes more sense. Like, oh, we need the weird like hexy-shaped kind of one with this jut out. There's only one of those in the box, so whoop! I don't know, so, something about it they did it most intuitively, but as for the game itself, it is like Mansions of Madness, but more, uh, instead of investigative, it is more exploration, which might sound weird, right? How, what exactly are the differences between that? I don't know, but when you play it, you'll definitely notice, right? Uh, Imperial Assault is more, you know, shooting focused and like beating up bad guys and then occasionally interacting with a computer or a door. Uh, Mansions of Madness is moving around finding clues, doing puzzles and everything like that. I do miss the puzzles in Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth, but you can also meet with different characters along the way, and you can have lots of really good story and interaction, and you're, you are you are rewarded for, for exploring new tile areas. You have to track down clues as well. Oh, there's footprints in different regions. Uh, let's follow those footprints. And then, whoosh, some new ch you know chunk of the map opens up, and you get benefits if you are the first person to explore into that region, encouraging you to kind of keep pushing forward. I like it. So I like this one a lot. So that's why it comes to my number four, Lord of the Rings Journeys and Middle Earth. Also, one of the games with the longest name possible. But very good. Very good. Then my, my number three is the quintessential Fantasy Flight game, uh, Twilight Imperium. Up until... Fantasy Flight Games published the Twilight Imperium first edition, right? Their very first go at it. They were basically a company that would bring over European comic books to the United States. The comic book market was not doing great, uh, and uh, you know, back in the '90s, like I mean, it was it was doing great, but there were also other issues and struggles with the industry, and so Christian Peterson decided that he wanted to make his big space game. You know, and, and so he put it out through Fantasy Flight, and uh, which was his comic book company. And it had, I mean, the, the story of this game is amazing. Go watch the, what is it called? It's the, it's the uh, documentary that Shut Up and Sit Down did for the, when Twilight Imperium 4th Edition came out. And it's really in, interesting, intriguing to hear the story, the backstory of this, how Christian Peterson gave himself pneumonia making copies of this game because he punched out all of the, all of the like, chipboard, uh, you know, paperboard stuff by himself and just inhaled so much dust that it got wet and he got sick. You know, just that's how much labor of love went into this, that the creator, the designer, and the publisher of the game almost killed himself to make it a reality. Uh, it, it's hilarious. It's a really good thing. As for the game itself, um, yeah, it's... It's massive, it's epic, it's sprawling, it's space, it's war. I like it. You know, I, I, I've admittedly not played this one enough, but the I do want to play it again. I'm really hankering to play it again, and I'm hoping that maybe, you know, given pandemic, maybe I can get like a, a, a tabletop simulator game of this in at some point or something like that. But I mean, I would have to dedicate like a whole Saturday because... Playing things online even slows them down, which is one of the issues I have with this game. 
Uh, I've not played it with six people. I've played it with four, and four seems really good because it still kind of keeps zipping and moving and stuff. And even at four people, it still only took like four and a half hours when people jokingly say, oh, these were those 12-hour games. Well, I haven't seen that, but I haven't played with six people. Now with the expansion that they announced, plus two people. I haven't played like that full-size table, so I don't know. Uh, Jordan in the chat says, good game. I think the opportunity for stories or what makes this game... Uh, which one are you talking about there? Because because the delay in the chat. Are you saying that that's, um, are you saying that that's, Twilight Imperium good game or never played it, or Lord of the Rings you haven't played it, but you do like Twilight Imperium. Twilight Imperium makes for good stories. You know you you, you embody these different factions and they they encourage you to play different ways and it's kind of cool when like the, uh, when the uh, what is it the the uh, techno virus or whatever it's called, you know, they get to absorb other people's technologies and so they don't have to develop stuff. They just, you know, benefit when other people do. Like all the factions are just different enough and weird enough that like, ah, yeah, this this game rips. Like I love, I love it. Jordan invites me to Omaha so we can get a Twilight Imperium game in. Sure, man. Sure, one day. <laughs> so moving along to my number two then. My number two is a game that admittedly I've only played one time physically, uh, which is more than actually my number five. I've never played Dragonheart physically. My number two, I've only played one time the physical board game, and the rest of the time I have played the app because my number two is Elder Sign. I love this game. Love, love, love Elder Sign, which is interesting because I am admittedly more of a hardcore, dry, themeless Euro gamer. You know, I'm all about those wooden cubes and everything. Uh, Jordan Hopper is kind of the Euro gamer of the No Cube Zone podcast, which uh, Elder Sign also never played. Dude, get the app. Uh, because this is one of those games where the app kind of renders the physical game useless, in my opinion. I was having a conversation with someone about how the Root app is really good and actually... Because it allows you to play the game and familiarize yourself with it more, it may, has made a, a lot more people actually more inclined to play the physical root game, which is quite an accomplishment for an app. Elder Sign does the opposite thing where it just wrecks it. There's no setup. <laughs> um, the dice, the digital dice in the game actually look better than the regular dice that come with the physical game. Um, and... I don't know, it's smooth. It's actually more challenging as well. Uh, that's true, Jordan. He, he accidentally typed Elder Sing, which that would be a nice, a nice twist on a Cthulhu-themed game. It forces you to sing. It forces you to, you know... To, I mean, I don't know anything about cultural references in the modern era, but I'm sure that you could have, like, a, a masked singer, right? And everyone's just the different elder gods. Nyarlathop, Nyarlathop, right? So, perfect. That's not ridiculous whatsoever. But Elder Sign is one of my favorite games. It's uh, it, it's a what I call a couch co-op, right? Pull out my phone, and then one day I play it on the couch, and we just pass it back and forth. Or I even play, I just play this one by myself. Like, it's really fun because it has a lot of those same type of things that the other Cthulhu universe, uh, the Arkham Horror Files games have. Characters with different abilities that really change things up. You get to face different Elder Gods who have different uh, Doom tracks and different ways that they mess with you. Certain Elder Gods, you know, lock up more of your dice so you can't roll that many each round. Other ones send out more monsters. There, I, th I think, I'm not going to say this as a fact, but... I think some of the physical expansions that came out for the game Elder Sign came out first in the app, I think. Because one of the other things is besides just moving around the museum, rolling dice, it's a really good dice system. You roll dice, you have to match at least one thing, and that you know, uh, you have to match at least one thing to a task you're trying to solve, and then you roll the other dice. But if none of your dice faces match the task, you have to discard one and then roll again. And so you are free to try and decide which ones you want to, you know, assign to the task and then keep rolling. And it's, it's a very simple but good system. Now, the base game takes place all within the museum, right? Uh, so you go from room to room and you solve these little tasks and eventually you get enough Elder Science to defeat the Elder God. 
but some of the expansions have really interesting adventures and quests that you go on. There's one that you face the mummy of of Egypt somewhere, right? Uh, not somewhere, Egypt, obviously. But you face one of these ancient Egyptian mummies, and it starts off with you in the town, in the city of Cairo, and there's no like disaster monster quests or anything going on. It's just kind of you're going around taking on these easy like negotiation challenges, this then the other, to get supplies, to get stocked up. And then after two rounds there, then you move into the adventure through the desert and you face lots of different challenges along the way. And then you get to the pyramid and then it feels really tight and enclosed. And and I don't know, man, like uh, it's Elder Sign's really good. It's It's one of those games to me that's better than it should be, given that all you're doing is rolling dice and kind of saying like, well, uh, yeah, let's, uh, I'm going to put this one over here. Roll the rest of them, right? It's like, it, what people say that King of Tokyo is like better Yahtzee for gamers, you know, or for that gateway step. This is almost a better system than rolling dice three times because you get more control and manipulation and stuff and you get special abilities. So yeah, Elder Sign is it for me. One of the best digital app games that completely wrecks the board game, but if you get the chance to play the board game, it's also good. It's also fun. Uh, uh, Jordan asks, do you get to play as Brendan Fraser? I mean, I play every game as Brendan Fraser. I don't know about you, right? But, uh, okay. Moving on to number one, then. My number one game that's published by Fantasy Flight Games might probably be a surprise. This is a game not actually originally published by Fantasy Flight. This is one that's not currently in production. So this might be a bit of a cheat. But my number one is Nexus Ops. I own the Avalon Hill printing, and uh, but I've also played the I've also played this one, the Fantasy Flight printing of Nexus Ops. Fantastic, simple, light, fun war game, skirmish game, battle game, dudes on a map. I don't know. I don't know these terms, right? You build units, and then you move them out on the map, and then you fight stuff, and then you. You know, then you, the end of your turn. I think you, you collect resources for every tile that you're out on, basically, right? And then the other players do it. So what separates this from other, like, move dudes around and roll dice in a combat game? Well, the fun thing about Nexus Ops particularly is that, uh, is that you have objective cards that you're working towards. At the end of every round, you also draw this objective card. And it might be something like, destroy one of your enemy's, you know, uh, Rubium Dragons. And you're like, oh, nobody has a Rubium Dragon out, so I'm going to tuck this objective card away for right now. And then when, you know, a few rounds later, at the end of your round, you keep drawing different objective cards. You're like, ooh, I want to win a battle in a uh, in a slime factory. Okay, now I'm kind of focused on that. And then, ooh, snap, someone moved the Rubium Dragon onto the slime factory. Now I can complete two of these objective cards at once. You know, I'm going to put everything I have into this. And so you're chasing these objectives because you're trying to race to 15... Uh, to 12 points and uh, Jordan I understand man I understand the typos it is typos are life <laughs> so every time that you win a battle you get one basic victory point right one battle one battle point but also if you complete these objectives in your hands that augment how many points you can get in a single turn you can just shoot up really quick so the game might be at like 10, 9, 9, 6, and that person with 6 points might be pooling a bunch of the resources to complete lots of objectives at the same time, and they might pull ahead. This is, for my money, one of the best simple combat games out there. I really like it. I really encourage that if you can find like a cheap used copy and you enjoy this idea of like tactical shooting, you know, war game, like light war game type thing, this is one to not sleep on. You can find copies on eBay sometimes for like in the $20-ish range. That's how I got mine. Uh, I, I believe that there's a tabletop simulator mod for it, which I would love to play, Jordan, sometime with, you know, with you and the Ice Pick guys, the, the other guys that we, you know, play with from time to time. I think it'd be a ton of fun. So uh, I, this is a bit of a weird one because I don't think it's, it's, it's absolutely not still in print from Fantasy Flight Games. I don't know if they have the rights to it or not, but... This is my favorite. So any of your favorites, anything that I neglected to mention, go ahead and and pop up in the chat, please, because I uh, I so, I mean, so one of the things that you'll notice is I haven't played a or I or sorry, there's there's quite a few I haven't played, 
right? There's a few games that obviously didn't get mentioned on the stream. Strangely, nothing Star Wars, which I love Star Wars. I love it, right? But Imperial Assault, not as good in my, for my money as uh, Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth. Uh, Star Wars X-Wing, I, I really like it, but I'm not willing to put the money in, you know, to, to own a full big set and everything. So that's the thing is it's like, the Star Wars games are fantastic. Rebellion is is brilliant, but if I were to choose between which would I rather play at any given point, Rebellion or Twilight Imperium, I'd rather dedicate the time to play Twilight Imperium again. You know what I mean? So there's just lots of little things like that. So uh, go ahead and, and leave in the comments at the end of this video if there's other games that I really should have mentioned or games that you absolutely adore and love from Fantasy Flight Games. Uh, these are these are mine, right? These are the ones that I'm going to continue to probably be playing a lot of uh, for the for the years to come. So anyway, my name is Chris. Thank you all so much for watching, and this is my top five games by Fantasy Flight. Uh, stick around in just a few minutes. I'll be going live with my top five games by Yellow. Thanks so much.